Yes, ma'am. Yes. Can we start? Uh, hello everyone, uh, a very good afternoon to uh, all of you. I hope uh, all of you are able to hear me. Uh, if anybody is uh, facing difficulty, uh, I would suggest uh, you uh, contact the host and inform us if you are facing a challenge with the audio um, and uh, also the video. Uh, there will be a slight delay in uh, the movement of the slides uh, as well as uh, the audio. So uh, we will try to take it uh, slowly so that you are able to um, follow us as we you know, um, do the presentation. So now uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to share the uh, slides. Uh, I think I have not uh, been given sharing options. Uh, I am not able to share the slides. Uh, can anybody help us with this? Uh, is Chetan, Chetan, can you share the slides? Uh, perhaps because I am not able, I'm not getting that option of uh, sharing the slide set. Uh, 
हेलो हेलो यस सर मे आई हेल्प यू या प्लीज गो हेड यस सर वी आर एबल टू सी योर स्क्रीन नाउ जस्ट यू कैन मैक्सिमाइज इट या सो चेतन इज शेयरिंग द स्क्रीन आई एम नॉट यस थैंक्स चेतन एंड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल बिफोर वी बिगिन आई होप all of you are safe uh, you your friends your colleagues and family wherever you are and uh, in these difficult times uh, you all are following all the preventive measures that are required uh, especially considering that uh, your region especially if you are in maharashtra mumbai and pune in particular you have been really hit hard uh, by this uh, pandemic uh, and in today's session i will uh, use uh, many of the references to this pandemic because uh, whatever is happening whatever the news is re related to this pandemic uh, you must be hearing about drugs about testing kits uh, about various uh, you know incidents prevalence data death rates uh, morbidity rates Uh, how this virus is affecting uh, the human body uh, of course uh, i would say 80% of those are not non scientific because those are just uh, news items but if you dig a little deeper you will be able to reach to the accurate facts and uh, this pandemic presents us in the clinical research field uh, with a very uh, i would say challenging as well as interesting opportunity uh we at ct quest uh, have been part of the clinical research fraternity uh, as individuals i have been working in, for 14 years uh, my colleague chetan has uh, been working for uh, an equal amount of years and we are engaged in uh, clinical trial management in development of skills and organizations in managing quality in clinical research and also most importantly in communicating the results as well as various aspects of healthcare and research and um, so this opportunity is uh, very good for us as well as uh, you know to reach out to individuals who are interested in this field and we will try to help you understand uh, of course this is uh, we are limited in our scope because this there is only a certain time limit uh to which we can go in this session uh but you are free uh to ask questions when we break for sessions there are three sections in the session today first just a brief overview of uh research uh then chetan will be coming on and talking about careers in clinical research and finally i will come back and talk about uh some basics about how to prepare for an industry interview uh beyond the session if you have any questions please reach out uh, to your faculty and we will be uh, glad to answer any questions that you may have even after the session so to begin with research you know we talk about clinical research but clinical research per se is just a small part of a very very wide field so when we talk about research we just can't talk about clinical research we need to also know before we develop a drug we need to know about the disease we need to know what is causing the disease what effects uh, it is producing in the body how prevalent it is and how frequently is it occurring so if we take the example of covid you know uh, if we were you know we didn't hear about this term uh even when you know in as early as december there was hardly any mention of covid or coronavirus uh suddenly in late december and january we start hearing about this and now you all are aware of how vast uh this disease has spread and right from that time scientists uh and researchers have been trying to work on how this disease is being caused what does this uh, virus do in the body it enters through our respiratory tract 
and then through the blood circulation it reaches various parts of the body uh, initially presenting as fever respiratory distress but then it leads to uh, inflammatory response in the body leading to sepsis and ultimately to multiple organ failure in certain uh, types of patients leading to the severe effects of this disease we also know through these studies that this is a very highly contagious organism so you know if you compare an influenza virus the common um, uh, the virus that causes a severe form of colds and upper respiratory tract infections which is prevalent in the uh, environment since many years one case of influenza can infect approximately one other person during its infective period but for corona virus we have found that this is three times or some in some regions even five times so one corona virus case in the infective period can infect anywhere between 3 to 5 other people so all this information that we are hearing we are learning is from what from from the research that is being done on this disease based on this this understanding we move on to the second step to identify what chemicals what agents do we have to target this disease to stop this disease to prevent this disease and to treat this disease and you must have been hearing about hydroxychloroquine uh, antivirals that are already approved that are being tested and tried in various trials uh, now all this is happening because we are short of time uh, the infectivity is very high the mortality is very high and that is why the entire process of uh, research has been speeded up two to three times but in routine practice all these steps take a lot of time and are very very strictly regulated and that is where i would say the crux of clinical research or drug development lies where you prove the safety of a molecule of a drug and you also prove that it is effective in the treatment of the disease now again taking the example so you know for hydroxychloroquine you know there is a lot of hype that it is effective but what we are not able to see in the results of the research studies so far one what it is doing to the viral load two whether it is able to reduce the severity of disease and these are the two fundamental questions that any drug has to answer it will not be enough if we show that the drug can you know reduce the number of days the patient is in the hospital uh, the latest uh, remdesivir trials that have uh, been reported the only results available so far are that they reduce the hospital stay of the patients from 15 to 11 days but that is not enough what it is doing to the infectivity of these patients is it reducing the need for oxygen reducing the need of ventilators that is the crux of this disease so perhaps we will have to wait for more results to come out perhaps when these are published maybe in june july we will have answers to these questions but in routine practice drugs are not approved unless you have questions to all these answers or at least to 80 90% of such answers so ultimately uh, chetan if we can move to the next slide what we do in clinical research is basically to improve the benefit improve the health and improve the access to treatment of the diseases we also work to reduce the risk of taking the treatment we also try to you know by providing treatments we try to reduce the disease burden so again taking the covid example the only way the disease burden of covid will reduce is when we have a vaccine we may have drugs to treat the disease 
but unless we have the vaccine we cannot reduce the overall disease burden in the world in a country even in you know cities like mumbai in pune and of course all of this has to be balanced with cost so for example the antiviral uh, remdesivir you know it's it's an iv drug and it is costing somewhere around 20 to 30000 rupees how can countries like india in africa afford that kind of drug so for us we will have to find generic versions or we'll have to find other drugs which are cheaper which can do the same thing for us next slide now when we begin the drug discovery it can be broadly divided into three phases the first is the preclinical phase which is basically where you are testing and the prototyping uh, developing the concepts checking the toxicity this is usually and almost exclusively done in animals once you have sufficient information to say that the drug is safe we move into the clinical phase where we test the drug in humans and finally even after marketing the drug even after the government gives approval to market the drug the manufacturers of the drug are required to provide safety data on the drug for at least 4 years after drug has been approved and these are called post marketing studies or post marketing surveillance which is a very important part of pharmacovigilance now so let's look at each of these phases in a little detail uh, if we can move to the next slide so how do you develop this concept first of all you have to identify an unmet medical need now that unmet medical need may be a new disease it may be uh, an existing disease which does not have very good options either they are costly or they are very uh, toxic to the human body um, so there has to be an unmet medical need and that unmet medical need will drive constant efforts to improve the management of the disease so you understand the dis disease you identify potential targets chemicals or drugs or biologicals and then you validate these targets to see which one of them will work in the disease so taking an example you know in the next slide we have an example on asthma so all of us know at present we have very good treatments for asthma isn't it you have uh, tablets you have inhalers you have iv drugs you have uh, inhaled corticosteroids and bronchodilators that can act for 24 hours so you only need once a dose once a day dosing but still why are we continuing to focus on asthma the reason is there is always a subset of patients that do not respond to these available drugs well and through the basic research to understanding of disease pathology and physiology we have identified that many of these patients who do not respond to treatment have high eosinophil counts in the lung we have also identified that one of the reasons for this is a protein known as apolipo protein a1 which is misregulated in cases where there is severe asthma or unresponsive asthma and after we have identified this protein we have found that in mice who are uh, induced to have as such asthma if you give an isomer of apolipoprotein a1 it reduces the inflammation in the lungs and reduces the level of asthma and so all this drug discovery in the pre clinical phase has helped us identify a target and now once we have our identified the target of what is our next next uh, action 
So if we move to the next slide, we will see that the work is not over. Now we have to manufacture this in small quantities. And there could be problems in manufacturing this product. Suppose, you know, for inhalational uh, device, you need a particle size of less than five micron. Suppose when you start to manufacture this product, you find that you cannot reduce the particle size to less than 10 micron. So it is clear that you cannot use this as an inhalational product. Similarly, when you manufacture the product, you find that you are not able to, you know, when you give it through, through the lungs, it is not absorbed. You don't find the levels in blood. You find that instead of, uh, you know, um, it gets all coated in the lung, it gets very highly uh, uh, concentrated in the lungs, which is unacceptable. Or you may detect certain safety issues, certain toxicities, which may tell you that even though this drug or this drug candidate is very promising, but this will not help because of the toxicity or the absorption patterns, distribution patterns, or even metabolism. You may find that the drug is absorbed and then is, you know, has a very significant first pass effect in the liver. So whatever you are giving, most of it is being lost. And therefore, you will require to give very high quantities of the drug to produce any therapeutic benefit. So all this is happening in the preclinical phase is happening in the animal testing labs uh, where this lead compound is being analyzed, optimized, and we are collecting data on all these aspects, pharmacokinetics, toxicology, genotoxicity, fertility studies, carcinogenicity. And we are also trying to identify which would be the best route of administration, what type of safety issues we may encounter with this drug, and what are the potential doses we can use in human studies. Once we collect all this data, we move into the clinical testing phase, which is known more properly as the clinical research phase. So if we move to the next slide, we will see that with all this data, we go to the government to seek permission for the first in human studies. And this application, especially if this is a new molecule, a new chemical entity is known as the investigational new drug. So phase one, first in human studies, we take healthy volunteers except in cancer drugs or in AIDS drugs. Our focus is only on matching the safety profile we saw in animals with the safety profile in humans. So if we know that the drug gets concentrated in the liver or has a significant first pass effect to the liver, we will specifically focus in phase one to see what is happening with the liver enzymes in healthy volunteers. Are we seeing a rise in liver enzymes? Is this rise unacceptable or is this rise acceptable, manageable as far as or reversible once we stop the drug. These studies are usually short studies, seven to 14 days, they will last. They are done in specialized centers where the volunteers are kept in-house for the duration of the study. And you will have the results in a couple of months. Once we have data from this, we move into phase two, which for the first time we check this drug in the disease that we want to study. So if we want to see, we have developed the drug in asthma, for the first time in phase two, we will give this product to asthma patients. Again, the focus is on safety because now we will also check the interplay of the drug in diseased individuals. We found that in healthy volunteers, the drug was safe, but there might be some comorbidities or some pathways happening in diseased individuals that may alter the way the drug behaves in the body. And it may create new safety in issues or it may exaggerate or increase the safety issues that we found in healthy adults. For the first time in phase two, we will also get some indication whether actually this drug works or not. These studies are usually with a small sample size last for one or two years, and you will have the results possibly in the second or third years. 
once you have the data from this you move into phase 3 which is the confirmatory study phase now per se all regulatory agencies especially the us regulatory agency wants at least two confirmatory studies at least two phase 3 studies before they approve the drug so again this is done in diseased individuals the focus has now shifted to efficacy if you cannot prove the effectiveness of your drug in this phase you will not get approval to market the drug you will also collect safety information and this is usually the study is done in a large population size lasts for more than one or two years a typically in oncology study may where you have to follow up the patient for five years may last for seven to 10 years ultimately with all this data you go to the government and you file what is known as a new drug application and the government examines your preclinical data your phase 1 data your phase 2 data your phase 3 data and then decides whether they will give you approval to market the drug and like i said before even after they give you approval to market the drug they still require you to collect safety information additional use cases for at least 4 years after the marketing approval has been given so this is how the clinical research phase phase 1 2 3 and 4 moves for a drug now if we take the example of covid here because we are using pre existing molecules which either have already been approved in the market like hydroxychloroquine or they have already completed phase 2 studies you will see a lot of studies being in the phase 3 phase so the regulators are allowing these molecules to directly move into the phase 3 without requirement of completing phase 1 or phase 2 this process is known as the expedited approval process where the regulators waive off requirements for preclinical phase 1 phase 2 because they have sufficient safety information on the drug they may not have effectiveness or efficacy information but they have su sufficient safety information on the drug uh, can we move to the next slide now all this looks very simple when i talk so if you look at the slide that has come up on your screens this is a very very long drawn process so if you count the number of years at the bottom it comes to anywhere between 9 to 10 years or even 12 years till you get the approval and millions of dollars have passed hands in this development phase then if you see that arc that is going in the drug discovery phase you may have identified 5000 to 10000 compounds but when these pass through various phases of the development hardly one of them gets approved and this is a known fact that out of 10000s of compounds only one receives a regulatory approval for marketing so you can see how risky how long how labor intensive how financially intensive this entire process is uh, many times people ask why is the drug so costly it is costly because the drug that has come out into the market has passed through such a rigorous process such a lengthy process such a financially intensive process next slide please now when you look at this and we, when you try to understand this drug development process it is not just finance it's not just the length of time what is most important is at least in the clinical research phase these tests are being done on humans and you cannot subject humans to uncertainty you no know? you can't say that it is a new chemical molecule i know it is safe so i will use it in humans and i'll show you it is effective no that is not how the drug development how the scientific community works we need evidence we need facts we need hard core evidence for any drug to prove that it is safe and effective 
and we also have to ensure that while we are testing this drug the people who are volunteering to participate in these studies are protected and that is one of the fundamental principles of clinical research that at any cost at any cost patient has to be kept safe you will sacrifice science you will sacrifice data you will sacrifice money to save and to protect the research participant so why why is this so important to us we'll see in the next slide where throughout history humans cannot be depended upon to protect fellow humans uh for those of you who are interested in this history these are certain uh case studies which you can read up uh how world war 2 experiments were done uh, the thalidomide tragedy the syphilis studies that were done in the us Uh, which ultimately led to a universal or a global guidance document for the clinical research industry which is known as the good clinical practice consolidated guidance now what is this guidance if we move to the next slide we will see this guidance the icsa gcp guidance chetan can we move to the next slide Chetan, can we move to the next slide? So, hello, is, Chetan. Yeah, he's moved. So, I C G C P is a very wide topic. It has four major sections. The first one is for animal studies, which is I C G C P safety or S. Then you have a section on efficacy which is for human studies which is labeled as e then you have a section on manufacturing which is labeled as q quality of uh, the the way the product is developed and handled and managed and then you have a section on various other aspects which is known as multidisciplinary which is classified as m now within the efficacy section on patient safety we have icsa gcp e6 which is international ethical and scientific quality standards to protect patients who participate in clinical studies and it is not just conducting the studies it is about designing the study it is about recording the data and it is about reporting the data and what we are doing when we use this guidance when this guidance is implemented in clinical research we are ensuring that the participants are protected and the data is accurate so if in clinical research somebody asks you what are the fundamental things that you have to take care of there are only two the first is protect the participant and second is the data has to be accurate complete reliable and verifiable now this guidance is implemented not just for the manufacturer or the pharma company if we see the next slide research involves a lot of other stakeholders so you have uh, the sponsor you have uh, which is the pharma company the developer or the manufacturer you have uh, the investigator who is the clinician or the researcher who is actually conducting that study and collecting the data and this researcher works in a hospital or in a specialized unit which is known as the institution and then you have overseeing bodies you have the ethics committee which is a group of 7 to 15 members uh, please 7 to 15 members which are involved in reviewing the ethical and scientific aspects of the study and then you have the government or the regulatory body you also have what are known as clinical research organizations that support the pharma company in implementing the studies in different countries and you have the site management organizations or the smos which are involved with the institution and investigator and help them in conducting the study 
So how does this clinical trial process run? If we can go into the next slide, how do these stakeholders interact during the various phases of the clinical trial process? So in this slide, you will see you have a startup, you have uh, you know, um, uh, conduct phase and then a post trial phase. Now the, in the startup phase, you have the sponsor or the pharma company or the drug developer who first of all writes important documents like protocols. They write about uh, the study drug in what is known as the investigator's brochure. They develop a document known as the consent form which is given to participants for taking their agreement to participate in the study. They prepare a dossier which goes to the IRB, which is the ethics committee and to the regulatory body for review process. Now, IRBs and regulatory bodies review the documents submitted by the sponsor, which contains data, which tells them how the sponsor plans to conduct the study, where they plan to conduct the study, which hospitals they want to use. They understand what are the safety issues with the drug, uh, what type of tests the sponsor plans to incorporate in the study to see how safe the drug is and to prove effectiveness of the drug. And only and only if they are satisfied that the patient will be pro protected, the study design is good enough, they will give approval to the sponsor to conduct the study. The regulatory body in India is national level. The IRBs in India at present are for each individual site or hospital. Now, for COVID, you must have heard that the government through ICMR has incorporated a central ethics committee. So for any COVID related research, the regulatory, the applications that are going to the regulatory body are also being sent to this ethics committee Central Ethics Committee at the ICMR, which is going to look at the COVID proposals in parallel with the regulatory body. But you still have to take your local ethics committee approval for the study. Now, once the approval is given, the role of the sponsor does not end, the role of the ethics committee does not end, the role of the regulatory body does not end. Chetan, can you click again so that the text appears? Please click again. Yeah, once more. Yeah, please click so that all the text is clear. Now, the sponsor cannot say that I have got risk approval, now you conduct the study. They have to ensure that the study is being conducted properly. They have to ensure that all safety data is collected and reported to the ethics committee and to the regulatory body. The ethics committee and the regulatory body have to oversee the study, whatever reports they are getting from the doctor who is conducting the study, from the sponsor, they have to see that the study is being conducted as per the plan that they have approved. Secondly, the safety, there are no new safety concerns with the drug and the study. And of course, the investigator is conducting the study and collecting the data. Once the study is over, the sponsor will analyze the data and will submit a report to the ethics committee and to the regulatory body. The investigator will ensure that the data is clean and will certify this data is accurate and then store these records for a period of at least 15 years in India. The regulatory body will examine the results of the study and say whether they will approve the product for the next phase of the study or they will approve the product for marketing. So this entire process is happening in the clinical research field. These are various stakeholders that are involved, the broad stakeholders. And these are where the opportunities for people who are in life sciences, who are pharma graduates and postgraduates lie because they have an understanding of uh, pharmaceutical products, they have understanding of pharmacology, of the systems, they have an understanding of uh, the uh, biologicals involved, 
So this is where the opportunities lie. And Chetan, if we can move to the next slide. We can see that every country has a regulatory body. So for US, it's the US FDA. For Europe, it's the EMEA. For India, it is the CDSCO. So what is the CDSCO? Can we move to the next slide? Is the Central Drugs Standard Control Organization, which is headquartered in New Delhi. It's also known as the Central Licensing Authority. Then in each state, you have the State Licensing Authority. This organization is headed by the Drugs Controller General of India, the DCGI. And the law that this authority enforces is the Drug and Cosmetics Act 1940 and Rules 1945. Now, within this law, you can see, you know, 1940, this is before independence, 1945 is before independence. It was only in 2005 when these, this law was amended to introduce what was known as the Schedule Y, which is related to clinical trials. And if you see, <clears throat> in the last four or five years, it underwent massive amendments, 2013, 15, 16, 17, 19. Ultimately, in 17, the government came out with the medical device rules, 2017. And as of last year, March 2019, the government consolidated all the changes in Schedule Y and came out with what is known as the new drugs and clinical trial rules, March 2019. And these are the rules that are currently implemented for the conduct of studies in India. So now, uh, uh, Stanaji, we can take a couple of questions, not many. Hello, yeah. am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Ashish, uh, at the start of the session, there was some issue maybe, uh, the internet connection and network issue. Uh, now we have some questions from the participant. The okay. first question uh, is asked by Dr. Kamal Singh Rathod. He's a professor in BN College, uh, Udaipur. I'll just request him, uh, Dr. Rathod, please uh, ask your question. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. It is very informative and very useful for all people, I think, they are listening. Uh, I want to ask you certain questions regarding these clinical trials. Sir, This, mm -hmm. uh, as at present, this is very critical situation for corona, and uh, there is no drugs available. So mm -hmm. how... Fast track will be uh, taking for making any drug useful for people, and uh, how this FIH will be useful here, and uh, proof of concept for this uh, um, drug, and sir, uh, how the safety will be um, assured for the patients or participants in this study. Okay, yes, so uh, uh, thank you. This is um, uh, multiple questions, so I'll try to answer uh, most of these. Uh, now, uh, the first part of your question was uh, looking at the COVID situation, how fast are these, this process being done? So uh, if you have noticed, you have not heard about any new molecule being tested. Right, sir. You have only heard information on current antivirals or you have heard information on hydroxychloroquine. So like I said during my session that this means that most of these molecules are now doing phase three studies. So they have already saved three to six years right. of preclinical phase one and phase two. Hmm. No one is at present trying to develop something at, at least in the drug field for COVID, a new drug. Everybody is working with the current drugs. Right, sir. The other is the regulatory process. You would have also noticed that, you know, we started getting cases in March, mm -hmm. major cases. Yeah. Uh, I think second March was the sixth case. And you would have seen uh, reports of plasma trials being approved in, you know, late April, 
uh, drug trials being approved in India in late April. So you can see that the regulatory uh, review and approval process has been expedited. It usually takes six to nine months to get a regulatory approval. Yes. But for COVID, it's happening in one or two months. Uh, the government came out with a circular, I think, sometime in mid-April that any issue, any marketing approval, any uh, import license, any clinical trial uh, for COVID has to be reviewed and processed within 15 days. So they have reduced their normal timeline of 90 days to 15 days. So that is about, that is to answer your rapidity of approvals. Yes, sir. So if you, if you apply, if you have the necessary documents and correctly, you should expect approvals within one month of your application. Now, the second part, I think the major part was uh, proof of concept. Now, proof of concept is technically phase two study. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes what happens is because you are short of funds or the drug that you have has a very narrow therapeutic index. So you don't want to invest in a larger study right. or in a very extensive study. So what you do is uh, with a small number of patients, you do, do a proof of concept study mm -hmm. and you sh see whether you know it's good to go ahead and do the larger study. So most of the time what pharma company do is when they are not sure, when they don't have the funds, they do this proof of concept and then they go to investors to seek funds. They show that this is safe enough uh, and has early signs of efficacy. It will be a good, uh, you know, a good piece of the puzzle in the unmet medical need uh, in the long run. And they seek funds. So the proof of concept studies are done for these purposes. Uh, now the final question was particip Final part of your question was participant safety. So. The GCP guidelines and regulations do not differentiate between what stage of development you are as regards to participant safety is concerned. You have to ensure that the participant is kept safe, whether you are doing a phase three study, phase four study, or you are doing a phase one study. So you have to ensure what you collect all safety information even if it is a trial on, you know, um, skin infections, you have to collect information for patient sneezing. The trial you are doing is for a topical agent for skin infection, but you have to collect information on also uh, any sneezing episodes, any other thing that is happening. So that is the level of collection of safety information for in clinical research. And all this information has to be channelized, analyzed by the sponsor. There are pharmacovigilance uh, um, de departments in the sponsor's end who collect uh, the safety information from clinical trials and they are on the watch out for any signals that are appearing. Then the government requires, even during the clinical trial, the sponsor has to submit the safety information at certain periodic intervals. So all this information is being collected for participant safety. Then there is also a concept of interim data monitoring committee where you set an independent committee which will look at the data at certain intervals. So for this uh, trial that was done, you know, active trial for rem uh, remdesivir, uh, the data that is available uh, that has been you know appearing in the journals and in the um, general press has come after the interim data monitoring committee has reviewed this data and cleared this data. So sponsors set up these committees to review and do an interim analysis. And if they feel that the product is still safe and uh, effective, they will proceed further with the trial. I hope I have answered your questions. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Ratu, sir. Uh, now we are having one another question. That is uh, from Professor Selendra Guru from Goa Pharmacy College. Guru, sir, uh, are you there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Please, please ask your question. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, first of all, let me congr congratulate you, sir, 
for wonderful lecture <coughs> uh, sir my question is uh, actually in this covid situation uh, we have two formulations uh, last week only we have approach to icmr as well as aims mm -hmm. to ask for the clinical trials of the same formulation mm -hmm. i would like to clear you the one thing here that the safety and toxicity data of those formulation has been already established but the response which we got from aims and icmr that we need to go for the cdsu for the clinical trials permission for the clinical trials other than the dcgi permission for the clinical trials mm -hmm. now the formulation it is nothing but a, some nutraceutical formulation and one herbal formulation mm -hmm. i would like to ask you what should we do in such case okay. this, uh, regarding with the clinical research condition right now okay so uh, i'll try to explain it uh, you know in one or two scenarios the first thing that is important sir is that you have to uh, be careful on what claim you are making for the product yeah yeah okay now the regulations say the moment you make a therapeutic preventive or diagnostic claim mm -hmm. it falls under drug category okay even if it is a herbal product even if it is a phytopharmaceutical yeah so once it fall, falls under drug category you will have to seek approval for the clinical trial from the cdsu yes yes okay now having said this there is a caveat the caveat is that if you want to do the study only for publication yeah. you will not manufacture market and sell the product you can do the study with only an ethics committee approval you don't need to approach the regulator yes but you have to be very clear that you will not use the data to approach any regulatory agency in india or outside india saying that we have done the study the results are good we want to market it or we want to sell it or we want to export it so if you want to do the study only for publication then i would say you approach your local ethics committee in a hospital where you want to do the study and tell them very clearly up front that this study is being done only for publication purpose we do not have any interest in marketing or sale or manufacturing of this product then based on the you know the data that you have and the scientific validity and the ethics they may you know give approval to the product up to the study uh, sir one more thing here uh, actually what they suggested us it's a better to go for the academic trials just to collaborate with any uh, uh, academic institution and you can immediately start with the clinical trials but the question for us is whatever the data will be generating from those clinical trials academic trials as you said we cannot submit it for the regulatory bodies and so we cannot commercialize the same product also so yeah. what is the alternative we need to go for the cdsco or dcgi for the clinical permission only see since you are a uh, you know you are uh, who owns the patent of the product we only own the patent of product right okay. now it's uh, a yeah, application application has been filed for the same uh, same okay. product see one way is to say to uh, do the academic trial what i explained you know for publication purpose that's an academic trial okay so do the academic trial till that time you will get your uh, patent approval okay okay you you don't the, when you do the academic trial you don't need to do a, a, a trial with a very large sample size it can be a small sample yeah yeah and you it would be like a proof of concept where you show that you know it is having a certain effect mm. once you get patent because you will need funds to do the trial clinical trials are very costly yeah yeah um, even a phase 1 phase 2 study could cost you you know a crore yes sir yes sir. so you will need funds so at that stage once you have finished the academic trial your patent is approved you can then you know approach various uh, pharma companies to uh, you know uh, to conduct the trial for you to take it forward in the regulatory process 
uh, okay okay uh, i will do one thing sir i will take the contact number from professor tanaji nandugde sir and we will, i will discuss with you in detail after this session only it's better sure. so that uh, other uh, other people will get a chance to ask the question and thank you thank you so much so one final question tanaji uh, yes 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 uh, we are having a another question from uh, anjali thakre uh, she is a student of dr d y patel institute of pharmaceutical sciences and research pimpri anjali are you listening yes yes good afternoon sir good afternoon sir my question is uh, what is the criteria for the clinical trial of orphan drug is it same as normal drug or is there any special guideline for the same okay it, okay very good question uh, this is again a category of drug now Uh, various regulatory agencies have a i know their own definition of orphan drug uh, you will be surprised till march 2019 india did not have a definition of orphan drug in the new regulations that came out in march 2019 the government of india says any disease any drug which will be used in a disease condition which has less than 5 lakh patients will be called an orphan drug now the funny thing is they have not told us what is this 5 lakh 5 lakh is new cases 5 lakh is overall cases you know what is it prevalence or is it incidence so 5 lakh is the cut off uh, for the number of patients that should be there for a drug to be classified as orphan drugs now for orphan drugs what they have done in the new regulations they have said one they will waive off the approval fee the approval fee for you know ranges from 2 lakh to 5 lakh rupees clinical trial approval fee so they say for orphan drug they will waive that fee off secondly they are saying they will expedite the process okay like i told you that most regulatory agencies want at least two phase 3 studies before they approve the drug so what regulators do is if your phase 2 data is good enough they may say they may give you approval directly at phase 2 or they may say just do one study so they may expedite the re review process third thing is what the law says is if your drug has been developed outside india and they have already the studies have been done outside india then they may waive off the requirement of doing clinical trials in india for an orphan drug so anjali am i able to answer yes. your question yes sir thank you yes. thank, thank you, you sir thank you so much yeah. so uh, all other questions uh, subsequent questions you may like i said you may address it to uh, the host and they can then take it forward yes yes so i now hand over uh, to uh, my colleague chetan who will talk about career opportunities in cr uh, over to you chetan chetan sir please start your video yeah uh, thank you sir uh there might be some network issue but i am starting uh, if there is there are any issues please let me know i will uh, put off yes 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 yeah please continue uh, thank you dr tanaji uh, for giving us the opportunity yeah i hope i you i am audible yes yes sir yes okay so good afternoon everyone uh, i will be talking about career opportunities in uh, clinical research so as we know uh this is tough time for uh, all of us but uh, the students attending attending this session i would like to inform them that tough time teaches us a lot uh, for clinical trial industry 2013 was also a tough time we survived that and we learned lot from that tough time so same uh, situation right now though we are talking about a lot of uh, opportunities and uh, market growth and blah 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 plus but uh, coming one year two year will be tough for our industry but there are a lot of opportunities also and if we survive and if we fight uh, during this time we will always win uh, this uh, situation so uh, in coming uh, 12 slides i will be talking about career opportunities mainly about clinical operations management and pharmacovigilance 
though there are different uh, uh, other fields also like medical writing, assess, uh, outcome research, uh, other uh, fields, but I will uh, specifically uh, talk about uh, uh, operations, uh, pharmacovigilance and data management. So uh, let's start with uh, the clinical operation field. Uh, what are the initial roles which are given to the researchers uh, we found? Um, life science graduates. So a study coordinator, uh, study coordinators are, uh, are the, the profiles which are the very initial level when you are fresher and want to learn the basics of clinical research, I would recommend this is the best profile and everyone should work at least a year, six months in this field to understand the basic ground level reality of the clinical research. Uh, I'm, I'm just uh, giving you my example. I started my career after M Pharma as a CRC with one of the uh, big shot in the industry, uh, Quintiles. I worked there one year as a CRC, then moved on to another position. So right now, if I, if I see my career as a co-founder of CT Quest, all, these, all those experience very very, very helpful to me at that time and now also, because when I lead the team of my colleagues, I know what are the difficulties they are facing, how to overcome those uh, challenges. So study coordinator is important. In the slide, uh, you can see uh, the clinical research coordinator uh, usually deal with so many uh, people and uh, stakeholders in the industry. They deal with CRA. Uh, data management, lab personnel, center pharmacy, regulator, ethics committee, investigator, and other side team members, and most importantly, patient caregivers. So CRC's role becomes very in the industry. If uh, CRC is good, the trial is very successful. If the CRC is not good, the trial is not good. 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 Usually uh, in India, uh, the fresher, the students who are uh, life science graduate or postgraduate, they is opportunity to work as a CRC or CTA, clinical trial assistant. And uh, the competencies uh, which is expected from the CRC that they should basic knowledge. Uh, like Dr. Ashish explained you very well, what are the process of uh, drug development? Uh, what is monitoring, audits, inspection? All those things uh, we should uh, have when, when we are uh, approaching any companies and appearing for any interviews. And expert knowledge. Uh, nowadays, uh, we really prefer, uh, industry people usually prefer the candidates who are well versed with the uh, additional knowledge and if they have any certifications uh, that is that adds and uh, uh, points to the column. Uh, regulations and reporting requirement are very important. For example, Dr. Ashish explained uh, uh, before a few minutes about the regulation schedule why recently we we have rules now uh, new drugs and clinical trial rules 2019. So we expect that candidates who are coming for the interview, they should at least read this regulation, then they must be aware about the, the regulations in India, at least. Essential documents. So uh, documentation is all about clinical research. We, we know this. So uh, what all documents are there in the clinics, like protocol, investigator brochure, ICF, CRF, all this knowledge, uh, the candidate should be having uh, principles of research ethics and uh, GCP, good clinics. What is safety reporting, SAE reporting, uh, very, very important. So we should be aware about the, what are the timelines, whom should we report. These are basic things. And the candidate should be aware, aware of study and site management, how to deal with the different stakeholders. A CRC has to... Uh, uh, deal with a watchman or pune of the hospital and dean or director of the hospital. The candidate should be uh, versatile in managing those uh, communications and uh, activities at site. Data management. 
So in uh, clinical research, we we mostly deal with uh, uh, document and then uh, uh, compile those document in the CRF and transcribe the CRF into eCRF electronic database. So all those basic information should be aware uh, about IP management, investigational product important. And uh, if we are doing a global study, the drug comes from uh, outside India. So how to manage the investigational product, its safety, its temperature recording, these are all the important part and uh, profile of the CRC. So CRC's competencies uh, should be uh, uh, based on the uh, points which I have discussed. Coming to the next slide, in a, a day in the life of a, a site coordinator, site coordinator have to deal with uh, many uh, uh, work in a day. You see they, they have the patients, have to counsel the patient, they have to attend the calls, emails, okay. Uh, when we do any study, there are recruitment targets. For example, three months we have to do Okay, so the pressure is always there on us that we have to complete this target. For completing the target, we have to apply different strategies. We have to support the principal investigator. Retention, retention is basically where if you are recruiting uh, 10 patient, 10 patient have to complete three year follow. So it's a CRC's responsibility and investigators responsive, uh, responsibility that the patient should complete all the visits, three year follow-up, that is 100% retention. So the sites who are having good track record, they are known as a good site in market and they are preferred for studies. So it's our duty to have a best retention rate, 100%. Documentation, uh, IP logistics, lab, ethics committee communication. Ethics committee communication is also uh, very, uh, we have to deal with the ethics committee, submit the proposal if there are any queries, we have to answer those queries. So these broadly, these all activities are there in the life of a site coordinator. Uh, uh, I'm explaining this because you will get an idea of what all activities you will have to perform if anyone is planning to enter into the clinical research field. Yeah, next. So the senator are placed at a hospital at, at a site. Uh, so to monitor their work, uh, there is one person appointed on behalf of a CRO or sponsor, which is called, known as a uh, clinical research associate, that is study monitors. Usually in industry, uh, we ex accept a person who is having some experience in ground level as a CRC or CTA, then the uh, uh, professionals are accepted more for a CRA role because they have a ground level experience and knowledge what is to be done. After a six month or one year or two periods, uh, they could be considered as a CR for a CRC, CRA role. Okay, so the basic uh, activities of a CRA is to select a site uh, when any project comes. So our expertise is there. If we want to select 10 sites in India, so you should be screening at least 20, 25 sites. From 20, 25 sites, you will uh, finalize 10 most potential sites for your study where you can expect a good performance and good retention rate. So they, uh, CRA has to train the site personnel, investigator, site team members. They uh, routinely come for uh, monitoring of the data. They review the data presented at the site, also compare the data, which is in the electronic database. So India is good place uh, for the other side of the world for the uh, remote monitoring also now. And I am assuming that this remote data monitoring work will be more with us in days or months in future. Review the uh, investigational product. So they very uh, detailed do investigate IP. For example, if you have received uh, 10 products, you have enrolled uh, th three uh, patients, you're given to IP to three uh, patients already. So accountability of IP is very important. 
and routinely come to the site and do IP uh, review. They review the documents and they use, many times guide the site what steps they have to take, what strategy uh, to uh, support the recruitment and retention rate. Yeah. Uh, so coming to the next slide, CRA competencies. So uh, basic knowledge we expect is uh, the knowledge of the drug development and this expert knowledge we expect from the CRA is regulations and reporting requirements. CRA has to be very well versed with the regulations and re reporting requirements. Essential uh, documents, obviously, they having the knowledge and information about what all the documents and which document has to be kept at which file and how to manage those documentations. Research ethics and GCP, obviously safety reporting. SAE reporting is very, very in the clinical research and we have very strict timelines. We have to report SAE in 24 hours to different stakeholders like sponsor, regulator, ethics committee, uh, study and site management, data management, IP management and site management. Monitoring is very, very important. Audits, preparation, inspections. So you see most of the activities and knowledge uh, uh, set is same for the CRAs and CRCs. But CRA, uh, they obviously, when they go to ground level, they must be having the more knowledge and information. So this is a, another profile, which is uh, in big demand. There are two uh, broadly roles, CRA. One is who, the CRA who goes on-site monitoring and remote monitoring. So demand of rims will be more in future definitely a day in cr uh, crs life uh, you see here they, uh, they usually are uh, travel to different sites they review the documentation the uh, for filing uh, site master file and ip and other uh, requirements logistics they take care they train in the, uh, the site personnel and they help in audit and inspection readiness to the site. Okay, and next uh, profile is of data management. Data management is very important. In India, uh, you must have heard about many companies, uh, IT companies, uh, TCS, uh, Cognizant, and uh, Infosys, and other companies are into data management is preferred uh, destination for IT related uh, work. So uh, in data management, usually uh, when the data is collected from the site and entered into the electronic uh, form, the data validation is done by the data management team. After the validation, they uh, do the cleanup, they do analysis, and they, they finally uh, reporting uh, part is done. The event document which goes to the regulatory agency is the CSR, Clinical uh, Study Report. So, so it plays very important role data management uh, people in the industry. Here we see the competencies uh, for the data management uh, personnel. Uh, they must be having the drug development knowledge, basics in the site and uh, study management, and in audits, inspections, uh, 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 activities. They should be aware about the research ethics and GCP, IP management, definitely. And uh, in terms of the expert knowledge, they must well versed with the regulations, reporting requirement, essential documents, safety reporting, and uh, data management. Okay, so uh, uh, there are a lot of in the market, and I've heard that companies like, like TCS still having good projects in hand for year 2021 and 22 also. So uh, the, the for, it's very important uh, for a candidate uh, to choose the field where they uh, want to go, whether in clinical research, data management, and pharmacovigilance. Yes. There are different roles and different activities they have to perform. So based on the candidate's interest, they should choose their field properly. So uh, just broadly, I want to show uh, how is the day in the life of a data management personnel. So they have to communicate with the different uh, uh, vendors like 
site, PI sponsors, and uh, they help in uh, set up the, the is okay. They help in writing the SOP, st study plan, uh, site master file, okay, compliance related work they do, electronic records, uh, cyber security, the uh, review data, uh, okay, and uh, query uh, many times there are there there are queries in the database so the expertise that uh, process uh, coordinate with the site personnel and help in answering uh, those queries and finally the data cable next important domain and uh, many candidates are now preferring pharmacovigilance i have worked in with who in past uh, uh, part of uh, w of National Pharmacovigilance Program. Uh, so very interesting book, uh, mostly deal with the safety reporting. Okay. Uh, so uh, IT companies have good uh, regarding pharmacovigilance work. So basically the study of safety uh, events and reporting is being done in this field. Okay. So you, you, you mostly that the, ground, uh, the people have to work with the, the software like Argus, uh, Oracle, and different uh, very costly softwares. Uh, you will be trained to handle this software. You, you, you will know the terms which are used in the, the clinical research. And as per the coding, we have to uh, handle the database and enter the details. So basic uh, competence competencies for the PV, mostly the same as we have seen for the CRC, CRA, and uh, uh, we must have a knowledge of drug development, site and study management, monitoring, audits, inspection, uh, research ethics, and GCP. Expert knowledge in this, uh, the IT companies must be expecting are the safety reporting timelines. One at uh, which I want to tell you, uh, Usually the IT companies take a technical round of interview and before that they take a aptitude test for all the students. Okay, so if you are planning to appear for the interview for pharmacovigilance field, make sure that you prepare well for the aptitude, quantitative aptitude and logical reasoning. English should be good. They, they uh, do not uh, review about your communication skills. So uh, uh, usually life science is problem in clearing uh, those uh, exams. So if you are doing any course, make sure that course should have these basics uh, uh, modules covered in your course so that any problem while covering this communication and aptitude related test. Okay, so yeah, the Life of a person in a PVG life is uh, to deal with the safety reporting, uh, review, uh, and reporting of the safety uh, events. Okay, safety plan and all. Uh, that's all from my end. If you have any question related specific to careers, opportunities, clinical research, we can discuss. Uh, Dr. Ashish, you can hear me? Uh, Dr. Tanaji, is it audible to you? Uh, uh, if there are any questions, we can take those questions, else we can move to the next. Uh, sir, I slides. have a question. Uh, yeah, please. Sir, I wanted to ask, what is the uh, role of uh, artificial intelligence in clinical trials? Like a lot of news is coming related to that. 
so maybe i think it is a bit out of what you have spoken but it's just out of my general interest i wanted to know so um uh, uh, first yes. of all can i know your name and uh, which organization you belong to so this is uh, professor sneha chandani from uh, dr dy patel ips okay uh, you uh, have uh, asked a, a question that is uh, of great interest to me uh, because uh, uh, the future if you say another 5 years time belongs to artificial intelligence data science uh, machine learning and uh, so how it is being used at present i'll talk about at present uh, you must have heard about uh, you know a, a a software that was developed by google for diabetic macular edema okay so what they did is they analyzed uh, global they obtained uh, images of the eye uh, in, uh, you know ct scan like images of the eye and uh, they developed a system which uh, machine learning algorithm which analyze these images and then uh, can predict you know if you send uh, if you submit a image to the system it will predict or it will tell you uh, what lesions this patient has especially for diabetic macular edema okay so uh, at present most of the machine learning and artificial intelligence is being used for you know um, developing diagnostic algorithms uh, so that you know uh, especially in the radiological field where uh, you don't have to depend on uh, humans okay to, uh, make an accurate diagnosis uh, so if you have someone you know um, a, suppose up in the interiors of maharashtra if there is a town they just have the machine but they don't have experts of that disease then they can you know link to the system and they can submit that image and the algorithm will tell them what the diagnosis is so that's the use of a generic explanation of the type of uh, use of artificial in intelligence the other use and which is now going to come in a big way is the use of machine learning and artificial intelligence in identifying drug candidates and their you know uh, potential safety uh, and efficacy elements so i would say artificial intelligence could end up being used, uh, used in um, uh, at the pre clinical phase where you know instead of doing a lot of animal testing if you have if you can develop this algorithm for your molecule or for your uh, company then this algorithm can help you identify drug candidates uh can you tell you that you know which drug candidates will produce what type of safety issues and what type of um uh, efficacy potential efficacy could be there of course it has to be validated in real time uh, but that is what uh, ai and machine learning will be able to do in the future i hope i have answered uh, uh, your question so so far in clinical trials they have not been uh, used we are seeing early uses you know uh, company see ai and machine learning is based on formulas and algorithms so you have to have certain existing data existing information okay. to use for so a if new yes if it is totally new molecule then you don't have any existing uh, information so there is a training set and a data set right? yes so there has to be a training set to be able to you know Uh, use ai but i believe uh, sometime because now we are a data driven society data driven systems are there yes. uh, you wait for another 4 5 years uh, you will start hearing about first uh, molecules being developed from ai okay sir uh, do the pharmacy students stand any chance in, in this field or this see they have the chance that uh, they would be aware of the pharmaceutical field but ultimately for uh, ai and machine learning you need to have a, a, a certification and knowledge about data science so you will have to do add on courses for machine learning and data science okay okay thank you so much sir yeah. uh, sneha hello they are please in pune uh, they are doing very good uh, yes sneha yes sir yes chetan yeah, sir in pune yeah there are few companies they are doing good in uh, ai uh, with respect to your questions and they are 
considering the pharmacy, pharmacy students also uh, okay. but you should have an additional capabilities like dr ashish said data science some um, certification or knowledge uh, inoplexus is a company in pune doing very yes. good uh, in terms of ai in clinical research and yeah thanks okay any other question Uh, sir, I think uh, we can uh, go ahead with the next part, and I think Tanaji sir is not in connection. Okay. Okay. Yes. So uh, again, this session is uh, this part of the session is more important. Uh, Chetan, I am taking over the screen. I was able to locate from where I have to do it. So uh, I am taking over the screen. All right. I hope you all are able to see this. I'll move to that slide. Just give me some time. Now, we may have the qualifications. Uh, we may have the experience even sometimes. But then interview is, uh, you know, uh, a totally different, uh, I would say, ballgame. It's a totally different scenario where uh, you are facing uh, and especially in the industry, the industry practice now is you have uh, at least two rounds of technical interviews. Then you have uh, one round of interview with the, your supervisor and then one round with the HR. So uh, minimum two to three rounds. Uh, I have been in scenarios where I have faced seven rounds of interviews. So... Uh, uh, you can imagine that you know how important it is to understand um, how to attempt uh, and how to involve yourself, prepare yourself for these interviews. So again, uh, we don't have a lot of time. We'll just go through some uh, basic fundamental tips. Uh, the key for interview, you know, is being prepared. Now, as students, I'll address this from the perspective of students is. Uh, there's a lot of preparation that needs to go in. It's not just knowledge of your textbooks, knowledge of the subject matter. You have to be aware in these times. So you need to know about the company uh, in which you are approaching for the interview. You have, uh, and the internet provides you ample opportunities. You just have to search by the company name. They will take you to the company website, to articles written by people in the company, or even news, you know, if these are big companies, news articles about the company, then every com company has at least social media handles, LinkedIn, Facebook, these are the minimum two. Now people are also moving on to, uh, you know, uh, Instagram, Pinterest, depending upon what domain they work in. So when you are preparing for the interview, even if it is for the entry level, you should know about the company or the organization that you are planning to interview for. You should know about who are the senior management representatives of the company, when the company started, what are the company's current projects, if you can get information, what are the company's values, cultures, and what do they aim to do? And all this information is available. Second is, the preparation also involves with small, small things, you know, what clothes you are going to wear. Now, as a student, you don't need to have very fancy, you know, a very brand labeled, very costly clothes. What the interviewer is looking for is how clean you are. You know, your, uh, your hair is properly done. Uh, facial hair, if you're keeping a beard, nowadays everyone keeps a beard, is properly trimmed. You know, uh, you have, uh, the clothes are cleaned, ironed, properly ironed. You don't need to be wearing a very fancy suit, uh, you know, from uh, Louis Philippe or from a very big brand. But at least it should be cleaned and properly ironed. And it should be professional. You don't go to an interview wearing clothes that you go wearing, you know, to a disco or to a party or to a, uh, you know, uh, travel trip. Secondly, even if you have sent your resume to the company, always carry one or two copies with you. Why I say this is because like I said, you may be subjected to one or two rounds or maybe more than that of interviews. 
and what usually happens is they try to do all those rounds together so while one of them one of the interview may may have gone through your you know uh, profile uh, they may not remember it or maybe they have not even gone through your profile so if you are carrying your resume two or three copies with you you can easily hand it over to them third is be well aware of what mode of transport you are going to use and for that particular time that you have to reach what would be the travel time don't be ever be late for the interview 5 minute pehle pahunch jao reach early 5 minutes but never be late because any excuse you give ki the train broke down the you know the, there's a traffic jam x y z it will not be considered it will only be a negative point against you the third thing that you have to be prepared for i'm not going to talk about technical questions because that depends upon the role that you are going to apply there are certain general questions that are going to come your way which are known as situational questions they will ask you to describe a situation you were involved in what did you do in that situation how did you face that situation and what were the outcomes of that situation so be prepared for those questions so over the next couple of slides i will talk about some of these questions so for example a very standard question tell me about yourself now even though we know everything about ourselves many times we find it difficult to verbalize to put words to our thoughts so when you are preparing for interview always try to write down an answer and try to practice the key points that you will say in response to this question it should not look like you have you know uh, ratified the answer and you are like they ask you the question oh yes i know the answer blah 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 and you parrot it out no it should come off as genuine you are speaking from your heart you are talking about yourself you are selling yourself and that has to come from your heart so limit yourself to you know uh, job related your qualification related responses unless you are asked about your hobbies then questions like do you consider yourself successful this is again a very tricky, tricky question for a student you know a student who is going for an entry level job how will you answer this so you will have to be prepared for certain scenarios for example you can talk about your academic career yes i consider my success myself successful uh, because i have passed this exam with a certain level of a proficiency um i consider myself successful because uh, my um, knowledge on this subject matter i am not an expert in everything but on this subject matter i have a detailed understanding of the processes and systems or you can talk about you know um, some achievement that you have made as part of your academic career uh, now of course it has to be again related to the job profile to the scientific field uh perhaps you have participated in some uh, you know um, project uh, you have done a summer internship somewhere so you can talk about those things another question that comes is what do colleagues say about you again it cannot be answered casually it has to be related to your work it has to be related to a specific example it may be an internship it may be a summer job it may be your part time job you know so you have to talk about that and you have to specifically say that mr so and so who was my supervisor during the summer internship uh, which was for 3 months when i left the internship he told me that i was very hard working or i was very diligent or i was very uh, good in communication um, skills or i was very organized in the way i did my work or i kept my documents so you will have to be very specific with that then i have already talked about this what do you know about this organization so of course you have collected information from the website but you have to use it very 
wisely. You have to use it in a way that it doesn't come out that you have read the uh, company's website. Se. So you can talk about, you know, uh, the company started in this. It's 10 years old and it is uh, primarily involved in pharmacovigilance. Uh, it is working with a lot of US and European clients. And in the future, it is looking to diversify in XYZ field. And all this information you can get from the internet through a proper search and reading about the company. Uh, then you can also get questions about, you know, uh, how do you work to improve yourself or gain knowledge or keep yourself abreast of the latest information? Again, this is a very common uh, question. And the reason they are asking you is that, are you stagnant? Are you enterprising? Are you, you know, um, uh, aware of what is happening around you? So, the when they ask you this question, what have you done to improve your knowledge? They are asking a lot, a very important information from you. So even though you have just recently completed your, uh, you know, um, say M, M farm or B farm, how are you? How are you keeping your abreast? Yes, I have a subscription of this journal. Uh, I am part of this professional forum uh, or this professional association. Uh, I am, you know, my college provides me with this journal. Uh, I, I, I read these articles. I am part of these groups on LinkedIn. So all this should be there and you can't just speak about this if you have not done it. It has to be genuine. If only if you have done it, you will be able to answer this question. Because believe me, if you answer this question properly and you take a name of a journal or something else, there will be follow-up questions to test you whether you are talking uh, the truth or you are just you know uh, creating some story. Another pet question is why do you want to work for this organization? Most of the time, what this is, this organization is very great. It will give me great salary and you know, a great growth path. That is all rubbish. That tells us, the, who is the person who is interviewing you, that tells us that you have no idea what you want to do. Absolutely no idea why you want to join this organization and where you want to be in the future. So when you're talking about what do you want to do, why, uh, why do you want to work for this organization? This ties up with question number five and four. What do you know about the company? What you are doing to keep yourself abreast? And why you want to work with the company? So all these three questions are aligned. You have to be very specific in you know why you want. Yes, because this company is in a domain area which is of interest to me. I uh, I'm a part of these professional groups on LinkedIn. I uh, like to read about pharmacovigilance, uh, safety information about adverse events. Um, you can take, if you have, if you are well read, you can take examples of some latest uh, articles or late, latest safety issues that have arisen and why those uh, kind of uh, topics interest you. And then you relate it what, with what the company is doing and where the company wants to be in the future. Are you a team player? You know, everybody wants to ask about this uh, and you can talk about, you know, yes, I am a team player. That's the standard reply, but you have to demonstrate why you are a team player. And that demonstration comes from a very, very specific example. Uh, you can say that I am part of, you know, uh, our college's XYZ sports team or part of the debate team. Uh, and then you, tell that uh, certain situation arose in one of the competitions where we were you know building this uh, project uh, we realized that we had left our uh, xyz equipment somewhere we were not so what we did is we worked like this or we were short of time and then we divided the work uh, i was assigned this work and uh, why that work was important because you know if i did not do this work then the next person's work would be stopped or delayed and the project would be delayed so that should show that how diligent how coordinated you are with other members of the team and because when you are entering an organization you will be the at the lowest level in the organization 
or the newest member of the organization so you will have to gel with the team the people who are above you who are below you who are parallel to you so that entire environment will be your team and then explain how would you be an asset to this organization so what are your key skills what are you building bring, bringing it bringing into the organization not only your technical skills but also your soft skills i am a good communicator i have interacted with so many my english is very good and you know i write articles i have written blogs on linkedin or i have written blogs i i have a blog on this topic so you when you answer you answer with specific examples that demonstrate that you are not uh, speaking from general knowledge or uh, gen in a generalized way so these are just some of the questions that are situational that are generic of course there is a huge list and many of these questions can be rephrased in different manners so when you are preparing for an interview uh, your personality matters how you present yourself uh, your technical knowledge what you are doing about it your knowledge and awareness of your environment of developments in your field of the company all that matter so uh, now i think you know we can uh, take questions if there is uh, anybody who wants to uh, ask questions on this section which is preparing for interviews sir uh, there is one uh, person ankur joshi who wants to Anyone? ask a question hello sir am i audible yeah hello so we have a question from uh, your voice is Nikans. breaking if you can uh, slow down or uh... so we have a question from uh... yeah if any other moderator can hear the question and uh, repeat the question because i could not get the questions the voice is totally breaking or perhaps you can type the question in the chat box i can answer that the person uh, the lady who is asking the question if you can type it in the chat box um, anybody else has a question I think most of the questions uh, are uh, already answered. And if you have any question, you can write at our uh, email ID, and we will get it to Dr. Raj sir and Mr. Chetan. Okay. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on this occasion. On the behalf of Dr. Diva Patil, Institute of Pharmaceutical Science and Research, Pimpri, I am very much thankful to our management. and our principal dr s chitrange for providing this platform and motivation for arranging this kind of webinars i am very much thankful to dr ashish rastugi his founder situcast llp for sharing his unmade expertise in clinical research i am also thankful to mr chetan halani co-founder situcast for enlightening the students about the career opportunities in clinical research i am thankful to all the participants who make this event fruitful and uh, there will be a link shared by dr tanaji nangude you have to give feedback on that we have link uh, participation certificate with this feedback form hence everybody is requested to please put their feedback by using that link now i for, uh, now i request dr tanaji nangude sir to please continue the session hello 
request uh, uh, sir i think sir is not reachable okay so okay. i request all the participants to please turn on their video turn on their video okay. yeah so we can have a group photo with our speakers of the day yeah 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 share that we had many viewers on youtube also and many questions were posted on youtube also uh, the session was live live streaming on youtube as well thank you participants visokar sir any more instructions to be given uh actually we have shared a link for feedback all of you are requested to please uh, share your feedback by using that link and you will get a participation certificate okay once you submit the feedback thank you once again thank you all thank you sir we are signing uh -huh. out yeah yeah please thank you bye thank you sir yeah thank you very much for your support yes sir no, yeah bye participants the link is shared in the chat box so you can click on it or you can copy and fill